My, what a weekend we have had. It's now a done deal. Benjamin Netanyahu is out after 12 years as Israel's prime minister. So who's in power now? And what can this new coalition do for us? And why is Netanyahu vowing to return to power? Chris Mitchell has more. Today, the new government posed for the traditional picture with Israeli President Reuven Rivlin. On Sunday night, by the slimmest of margins, 60 to 59, the Knesset approved the new coalition government. During his speech, incoming Prime Minister Naftali Bennett was heckled constantly by members of the opposition. But Bennett, who was once Netanyahu's ally and now rival, recognized his former boss. Thank you, Benjamin Netanyahu, for many years of service and lots of achievements for Israel. As prime minister, you worked for many years with devotion and to our political and defensive power. Netanyahu now serves as leader of the opposition and cited how his governments have transformed Israel. And if it is destined for us to be in the opposition, we will do it with our backs straight until we topple this dangerous government and return to lead the country in our way. Netanyahu questioned if Bennett would be willing to disagree with U.S. President Biden and vowed he would be back. Bennett now leads a checkerboard coalition of eight parties, representing left, center, right, and for the first time, an Arab Islamist party. Well, it's true that this government uh, uh, has a very uh, difficult path ahead of it, a narrow parliamentary majority, a very heterogeneous uh, government, and, uh, and in this respect, it will be challenging to keep it together. Right after the vote, the new government held its first cabinet meeting. It faces daunting challenges at home and threats outside its borders. Still, earlier this year, Bennett told CBN News he was up to the job. I'm ready to, to take that responsibility as former defense minister, former entrepreneur and CEO of uh, companies. I think I've got what's necessary to pull Israel out of this hole and sort of go to the next phase of Israel as the startup nation. While President Joe Biden congratulated Bennett, differences between the two allies on the Iranian nuclear deal may test the new government. The renewal of the nuclear agreement with Iran is a mistake, a mistake that will give legitimacy again to one of the darkest and most violent regimes in the world. Israel will not let Iran arm itself with a nuclear weapon. Israel is not part of the deal and will continue to maintain full freedom of action. After four elections and more than two years of political paralysis, it remains to be seen if this new government will provide the stability many Israelis are hoping for. Well, Chris joins us now from Jerusalem. Uh, Chris, you've interviewed Israel's new prime minister. Tell us more about him. Well, Pat, uh, we learned when we uh, interviewed him just a, f a couple of months ago before the last election, he's a religious man. He's probably the first uh, Israeli leader, I think, in modern history that wears a kippah. So, uh, and some people say he's the first religious leader since temple times. He served in an elite special forces unit. He fought in the 2006 uh, Second Lebanon War, the one we were up on the northern border, uh, Pat. Uh, he's made millions as an entrepreneur. And uh, in his speech, he, he wants to bring Israelis together. He wants to promote Aliyah. He says he wants to have a new page with Israeli Arabs, and certainly uh, that's part of uh, the coalition they have for the first time uh, in Israeli Arab party. Uh, but he faces such a tough challenge, Pat. I mean, to be leading Israel and keeping this uh, coalition together, parties from the left, center, right, and the Arab party, uh, they've succeeded in ousting Netanyahu. That was the ide ideological glue holding them all together. But the question is, can they agree on how to govern together? Uh, they'll be tested uh, right away. Uh, this man, Lapid, he is uh, second in command. He's uh, going to be minister of foreign affairs. Tell us about him. Well, Lapid is uh, a sort of a center-left uh, politician here. Uh, he's a former journalist, and really his father was actually part of a uh, Shanui, which is a, a political party years ago that was really anti-religious, anti-ultra-orthodox. I think he's really sort of the power behind Bennett right now. He was the one that was able to put this uh, coalition together, and uh, and so he's, he's really going to be prime minister in two years if this government uh, can last. But they're facing huge geopolitical 
fundamental issues, uh, Pat. Yeah, they're facing uh, Iran. Uh, Bennett addressed that in his speech, as we had in our report. And uh, they're unified on Israel, Iran not getting uh, the nuclear weapon. Uh, but the question is, and that's the question that Netanyahu raised, can, can they stand up to the Biden administration? Uh, that's going to be a, a issue, a divisive issue about Iran and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and so I was talking to a former leading Israeli diplomat earlier today, Pat. Uh, he said that Israel may need to be firmer uh, with their superpower, superpower ally, and we'll see how they're uh, able to do that. Uh, Chris, uh, the, the last question, what, what about this Palestinian state? They, they, uh, I'm sure that Natalie Bennett doesn't want such a thing. What is the uh, posture of this new government? Well, that's one thing that divides some of the uh, government. Uh, Bennett certainly doesn't want a two-state solution. There are other members of his party, like the far left or the, Me Merits, uh, the Merits Party. They do want a two-state solution. So that's one key issue, what's going to happen when this government has to make a decision. For example, in the budget, Pat, they have, uh, they have certainly... Uh, uh, allocating funds for roads in Judea and Samaria. Uh, will that be part of the budget? That's uh, one of the questions. And I just wanted to add, Pat, you know, last week I was at the Knesset. It was part of the Jerusalem prayer breakfast. It was hosted actually by a member in Bennett's party. His name is uh, Metan uh, Kahana. And, uh, and so what I was able to, I was actually asked to speak. So I read from your Herzliya speech in 2004. And in that speech in 1974, you, uh, you had interviewed uh, Itzhak Rabin, and he, that's where he pledged, uh, he asked that, that the United States would be strong. And that's when you pledged that night on the Mount of Olives that you would stand with uh, Israel no matter what. And uh, they felt alone then. They feel alone now. And that's why your support for Israel is so critical at this time and also for people to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Chris, great story. Thank you so much. Well, in other news, President Biden is meeting with economic and military allies in Europe. So how will he handle Russia's President Putin? And is Biden coming from a place of weakness? Ephraim Graham has more. Pat, President Biden gathering with NATO leaders in Brussels today where challenges from Russia and China are taking center stage. The alliance expected to label China a security risk due to its cyber attacks and naval expansion. This all comes after the weekend G7 summit in England where leaders from the world's strongest economies condemned China's human rights abuses. The NATO nations will reaffirm its central tenet. An attack on one member is an attack on all and consider expanding that to include cyber attacks. That's a major topic in the upcoming summit between Biden and Russia's President Vladimir Putin after attacks by Russia-based cyber gangs targeted America's fuel and meat supplies. Both leaders agree U.S. and Russia relations are at historic lows. Recently, Putin responded to a question about President Biden, referring to him as a killer. When President Biden was asked whether he believes you are a killer, he said, I do. Mr. President, are you a killer? <laughs> Over my tenure, I've gotten used to attacks from all kinds of angles and from all kinds of areas under all kinds of pretext and reasons and of different caliber and fierceness, and none of it surprises me. President Biden and Putin meet in Geneva on Wednesday. As President Biden heads into that crucial summit, critics of the administration say its policies are projecting a perception of weakness to America's enemies. Dale Hurd has more. At the G7, Joe Biden announced America is back as a world leader. But some believe his administration's policies are making the world more dangerous. Biden entered the White House set to ride a post-COVID economic boom and correct what Democrats consider Donald Trump's reckless foreign policy. But after a series of setbacks at home and abroad, Biden has been dubbed the master of disaster, who is taking America back to the dark days of Jimmy Carter. High gasoline prices and inflation have returned at home, but critics say far more problematic is the perception among our enemies abroad that America is weak again. As Joe Biden makes good on his promise to roll back Donald Trump's foreign policy, it certainly doesn't feel as if it has made America or the world safer. 
North Korea greeted the new administration in March by firing missiles into the Sea of Japan. The White House response was basically, don't do that again. That same month, China mocked and humiliated the U.S. delegation at a summit held on U.S. soil. The White House has decided to reopen talks with Tehran over the Iran nuclear deal and even lifted some economic sanctions, which some experts say will increase the chances of a future war between Iran and Israel. And it resumed hundreds of millions of dollars in U.S. aid to the Palestinians one month before Hamas fired rockets into Israel. And every one of those rockets might as well have Joe Biden's name written on the side of it because it is his weakness, his appeasement, his moral relativism and ambiguity, his lack of backbone to stand up and stand with Israel that is causing this war in the Middle East. Frank Gaffney was an undersecretary of defense in the Reagan administration which had to rebuild America's foreign policy after the disastrous Jimmy Carter era. I would describe Joe Biden's foreign policy as basically Barack Obama's on steroids. I mean, think about this. A little over 100 days ago, Israel was in a totally different position than it is now. And that's 100 percent because of the Biden foreign policy mistakes. The White House has also decided to cancel America's Keystone Pipeline and 10,000 jobs while allowing the completion of Russia's Nord Stream Pipeline to Western Europe, something former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Sunday the Trump administration would have never allowed. We made clear that that pipeline was not going to be completed. It would not have been completed. Had we had four more years, I'm very, very confident of that. Old hands like Gaffney say they've seen these kinds of policies in action before, and it doesn't end well. A troubling prediction as Biden heads into his first meeting with Russia's Vladimir Putin. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Back here at home, more than 50 million Americans in the western U.S. are facing oppressive heat in the coming days. The National Weather Service to issue excessive heat watches and warnings throughout California, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. Temperatures soaring to more than 100 degrees in most areas and predicted to top out at, get this, 118 degrees in Phoenix. That's scheduled to happen on Thursday. Ouch. Pat? Well, you know, uh, those who look for global warming, they're finally getting an answer to their prayers. We're getting it, and it's getting it in spades. It is going to be powerfully hot. And all we can say right now is stay indoors, stay cool, stay hydrated, and don't be a hero. I remember uh, jogging when I was in my jogging phase out in Phoenix when the temperature was about 107, and uh, it wasn't long before I was facing heat stroke and didn't even know I'd gotten it. So. Please be careful. The walking dead. That's how hundreds of migrants stumble out of the jungle after a six-day walk through one of the most dangerous places on Earth. It's called the Darien Gap. And so where do they land? In a small village so overwhelmed the entire place smells like human waste. And where are they headed? You guessed it, the U.S. southern border. Our Chuck Holton takes us deep into the jungles of Panama, along with one congressman who wanted to see this horrific crisis firsthand. There's a flash flood of human misery flowing down this swollen river, deep in the Darien Gap, that lawless jungle region between Colombia and Panama. Rarely seen numbers of migrants from across the globe are taking their chances on the six-day walk through Hello. the jungle, heading for the U.S. Many of them never make it out alive. Bajo Chiquito is the last outpost of civilization between Panama and Colombia. The lifestyle of the Embera Indians who make their lives here hasn't changed much in hundreds of years. They still rely on the river for everything from food to transport. With no running water or electricity, the one thing this village has is too many visitors. Migrants emerge from the jungle in small groups throughout the day, exhausted, sick, and injured, suffering everything from parasites to trench foot. It's a three-hour ride upriver to the village in a dugout canoe, and on the way, you get a sense of the scope of the problem. So we're still about 45 minutes away from Bajo Chiquito and we're being passed by hundreds of migrants heading down to the next camp. 
closer to the Pan American Highway. Looks like most of them are probably Haitian or Cuban. By the time we got to the village, more migrants had already replaced the ones we passed on the river. More than 300 people per day are arriving at Bajo Chiquito, and the volunteer medics working in the village are completely overwhelmed. So is the city's rudimentary sewer. The entire village smells like human waste. We have no electricity here. Look how we are living. The migrants keep coming more every day. We are in a very difficult position. Also on this trip, Wisconsin Congressman Tom Tiffany. Well, the reason I went both to the Rio Grande and now down to Panama is I wanted to see it for myself, to see if it was as bad as what was being represented. When I went to the Rio Grande, it was clearly worse. And it's happening down here also in the Darien Gap. This is an incredibly arduous journey that people are going through the jungle in order to get here. And I mean, we see it right here. People's feet torn up, being carted around in a wheelbarrow. It is awful what is going on and there's no reason for it. The horror stories that I'm hearing from the people coming through here as they step out of the jungle, they're just literally stepping out. They're finishing their walk right this minute as they come out of the jungle. And they're limping their way in, literally, in very bad shape. And they're all telling me there's so many people dying. There's so many people that are dying out here. They have a population of almost 500 people. They've had over a thousand migrants at a time that have been going through here. And it's completely disrupted this community. This is a crazy thing. I'm seeing it, gracias. I'm seeing these, hearing these stories from these Haitians, but they're not coming from Haiti. They're coming from all over the place. They're coming from Chile, Peru. That guy said he spent eight years in Brazil. So obviously, they're making a life in Brazil. They're making a life in Peru. It's better than Haiti. They're not being persecuted there, but they've decided that now is the time to go to the United States. And the question is why? It can be stopped if the Biden administration would just say, okay, we're gonna reverse what we did back on January 20th. We're gonna secure the border once again, because that's what's unleashed this. And it's overwhelmed this community of Bajo Chiquito that we're in right now. From Panama's Darien Gap, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Well, don't believe what the lies of the media are telling you. Chuck was down there, that's what it looks like. It's horrible. It is a terrible crisis. Thousands and thousands of people are pouring into the United States. Kamala Harris was uh, given the task of securing the border. That's her job, and she hasn't even gone down there to look at it. Why not? Because the Biden administration does not want any publicity on this horrible thing. They have started it. And they've got to stop it. And all they have to do, if they want to finish the wall, number one, tell these people, we're not going to receive you. You're going to be taken back home. You're not going to be brought back into the United States. And one thing for sure, we're not going to be dealing with the cartels and making them, allowing them to make huge amounts of money on the suffering of these people. But it's a crisis. It isn't a, just a, a little problem. It's a major crisis. And the Biden people don't want to face it. Why? Because if they face it, they'd have to acknowledge Donald Trump was right. And they don't want to do that. Terry? Barry Abernathy's adopted son, Tyler, may not have his dad's eyes but he does have his hand. In fact, that's why Tyler called Barry his father when he first saw him. So why was Tyler so convinced? See for yourself. I've never had a thought of, uh, before all this happened, never had a thought of uh, raising young kids at 50 plus years old. I mean, you know, that never had crossed my mind. Barry and Beverly Abernathy had already raised two daughters into their teen years when their older daughter Chastity came home from work at a daycare center excited about two foster children. She came in one day talking about these children and she said, Daddy, the little boy, she said, you're just not going to believe it. She said, he's got a hand exactly like your hand. And she said, it's exactly like yours. Barry was born missing most of his fingers on his left hand. 
Still, he's a two-time Grammy-nominated banjo player and singer with the group Appalachian Roadshow. Chastity knew the kids were struggling and pleaded with her parents to help. I called my mom first and I sent her a picture of Tyler and she said, Chastity, you're crazy. Cause I mean, I had the tendency to call her about kids before, but I was like, mama, this time's different. You gotta, you gotta come meet him at least. And she just let it go. And I told my daddy and he said, you are crazy. And I said, well, honey, there's no way. I mean, we, we're not fosters. We, it takes, you know, months of classes and then you gotta, you gotta get educated on how to handle foster kids. And, and we're not even prepared. The siblings, Tyler and Zoe, had already been through eight different foster homes in the last two years. Beverly was reluctant to get emotionally involved. I work in the court system and I see these kind of things happen, like kids placed in foster homes and everything, and I was like, I will never get that attached. I tried to like stay away from it, keep it separate from our life. I was really crying because I felt so strongly about it because I'd met them and I knew if they had met them, that they'd feel the same feeling I did. It was just a drawing towards them, both of them. A few weeks later, Barry was leaving town for a concert. Before driving off, he felt prompted to stop by the daycare center to meet the kids. Uh, the little boy, Tyler, was the first one I seen. He was in, in uh, class, and they were kids were out playing. He was sitting at a little bench, table-like thing with one of his friends. And my daughter, Chastity, had shown him me playing uh, I, I, the dance, dance, dance video uh, of uh, Appalachian Roadshow where I was playing the banjo with no fingers. Well, he had never seen, he had never known a dad, had, had, had a dad, and uh, he had never seen anybody with a hand like his. So he immediately, to my dismay, he immediately thought I was his dad. So he looks up and he, his eyes like that, and he reaches over and he gets his little buddy and pats him on top of the head and he said, hey, look. That's my dad. And he jumps up out of his chair and he starts running to me. And he just runs and just I was standing there and he just jumps up and grabs a hold of me. So I pulled him on up and he grabbed me and he grabbed my face and he looked back like this. And he said, Are you my dad? And I said, <laughs> I just kind of froze, you know, I didn't know what to say. And he said, You my dad. And he reached up, he kissed me on the cheek and he patted me. And it was touching. I mean, it was very, very touching. Barry then found out Beverly had also felt drawn to the kids. He called me and he's like, I went and saw the kids and I said, well, I did too. And he's like, Phew. he's like, what do you think? And I said, I really don't know what to think. She said, do you think we're going, we're going to need to do something? I said, well, what can we do? We're not foster parents. There's nothing we can do. Things weren't working out with the current foster family. So the Abernathy's arranged to take the kids over Father's Day weekend. After a great time together, they got word Zoe and Tyler would soon be sent to an orphanage. The state had called us that we're going to come get them. So immediately everybody went to jumping and saying, hey, can y'all can y'all keep these kids a little while while we're working something out? And we were like, yeah, we'll, we will. And it's amazing how something like that could happen. And in a couple of days, it could come to fruition. And nobody, nobody knew, but God, nobody did. The Abernathy's went through the steps to become foster parents. Then they made a big decision. Ten months after that Father's Day weekend visit through a Zoom court date, Tyler and Zoe were adopted and officially became part of the Abernathy family. Yes, baby. <laughs> oh, it was it was a blast. Yeah, it was, it was a, and I think the kids they they recognized it. You know, even they, I don't know that they knew what Tyler says doction. He didn't know what doction was, but exactly. But he knew that he was Abernathy. I can't like remember my life before them. Like, there's no other way to describe it other than like they belong to us. Well, I'm thankful that God brought them into our lives because I don't know, it's just, you know that they're here for a reason. Like when we adopted them that morning, you could just like feel it like the Lord was with us and it, you just knew it was right. The correlation between us and these children and God and all of his children, you know, I, that, I've thought of that a lot. We're all adopted in the family and not just adopted, but we're, we're made partakers. I mean, we're, we're, we're partakers of, of, of life through him. Tyler all the time says, thank you, mommy, I appreciate you. He lo he thanks, thanks us for the house, everything. And it's just like to see the world through their eyes, the simple life, that's what it means. Nothing else matters. Father's Day will take on a different meaning. The fact that we, we took these children in on Father's Day, uh, the family came to, together as a whole on Father's Day last year, and it'll always be special to me. The uh, you know where it might not have been as special before, 
uh, just to know that the way God dealt with us and what He gave us and what He uh, what He required of us, you know, all that coming together on Father's Day, uh, it, it'll be a special day from now as long as I live, for sure. You know, the Bible says God puts the lonely in families and hats off to you, Abernathy family, for giving these children uh, stability, love, uh, hope, a future. <clears throat> I believe that that's God's intention for every child. Sadly, it doesn't always work out that way, but thanks for listening to your heart because God wants to use all of us to make a difference. Well, grab your smart device and head to CBN Family for more great Father's Day content. Our app has inspiring stories, just like the one about the Abernathys that you just saw. Plus, you're going to find hilarious specials from Thou Shalt Laugh and then exclusive features from comedian Michael Jr. Not only that, Gordon will show you how to make a sizzling steak that's guaranteed to get Dad's mouth watering. I tried it. It's really... Perfect. It's all on CBN Family, so make sure to head to CBNFamily.com or you can download the CBN Family app today. Pat? Well, still ahead, we've got your email. Melissa wants to know, will we have an angel when we die to take us to heaven? That's it. Well, we've got that and your uh, questions and honest answers coming up. An excerpt from CBN Family's Father's Day. What is the difference between fathering daughters and fathering a son? Each one was unique, and the amazing thing was discovering that their personalities were there instantaneously. Mm -hmm. They didn't have yeah. to learn something to develop their personality. And I like to tell the story of Evelyn's first word was book. She was yeah. very studious. Yeah. She loved to read. She loved to study. She loved all those Aww. things. So Patrick's first word was me. ball. Okay. He was really big into sports. Yeah. And Lauren, uh, Adelia, is yeah. now, uh, well, she's not a college graduate, and she's going through job interviews. Yeah. But it's, um, her first word was dadu. Because <laughs> she was that. she was very much a daddy's girl. Yeah, she yeah. Wanted, she wanted to have dadu. She, cool. she was very relational, mm -hmm. uh, very social. Yeah. And it was, you know, I, she always wanted eye contact. Yeah, I love that. That's cool. For more from Gordon, go to CBNFamily.com. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Sean Foyt brought his Let Us Worship Summer Tour to Virginia Beach Friday, where hundreds proclaimed the name of Jesus. Severe weather forced the event to move indoors to Rock Church, where people sang praises and danced while experiencing healings in their bodies and souls and leaving their burdens at the altar. Foyt says he's believing for revival in every city he visits. After months of lockdowns and closures, the Hope Bunkers outreach to vulnerable children supported by Orphan's Promise in Costa Rica has reopened. Due to school closures, many children struggle with virtual learning, lacking the resources to do their schoolwork. The Orphan's Promise team worked hard to meet Costa Rica's strict safety measures. Now children are once again getting learning assistance, meals, and biblical education with Superbook in a safe environment. If you'd like to find out more about what CBN and Orphan's Promise is doing around the world, you can visit orphanspromise.org. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's all coming up right after this. Well, it's time for your email questions. And Pat, this first one comes from Melissa, who says, Good day, Pat. I'm from South Africa. I have a question. Will we have an angel when we die to take us to heaven? Well, you know, Jesus said... Uh, I'm going to come and I'm going to send the angels to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. So uh, is, it, is it a mass thing or an individual angels? You know, we talk about Lazarus and, and, and uh, he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. So, I, you know, why not? I, I can't say exactly. The Bible doesn't say, yes, you are going to have a special angel, but the angels are in there. So... Mm -hmm. Why not? Purpose. It's yeah. a nice thing to think. Yes, I mean, you know, the, God would send the angels to carry me into heaven. It's be wonderful, all right? This is Susan who says, why are people so threatened by Jesus? No one persecutes Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims. Why is Jesus, who's a God of peace, love, and salvation, so hated and so divisive? Uh, 
because there's a devil, and the devil hates people who are being born into the kingdom of God, and they know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by him. And he also gave his disciples the authority to bind Satan. And so if we take our authority like we should, we can control satanic uh, activity. But we're, the others so often are motivated by Satan, they don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. So why are they persecuted? That's why, all right? This is Taylor who says, I'm a new mother to a four month old and I'm trying to balance my life. I'm finding it very difficult to find time and energy to do anything for myself, let alone spend quality time with the Lord. I'm feeling so much guilt from this. What can I do to keep my relationship strong with the Lord while tackling motherhood? Look, I had the same thing when I was going to seminary a long time ago when I had children and I had all these burdens. I just had to get up early in the morning, and it, it, it imposes on your sleep, but the, the Bible says, uh, early will I seek you, and I, I think that's what you've got to do. You've literally got to set the alarm and get up, and you don't want to because you're tired, and you say, I can't do it, but when you wait upon the Lord, you renew your strength, and as you wait upon Him and talk to Him, He gives you an infusion of strength so you can handle it. But that's what you have to do. You really have to have some timer. When you, otherwise, the, the world just gets all, I mean, it takes control of your life. And you don't want that, all right? This is a viewer who says, in marriage, when a husband is continuously arguing with his wife and the wife is feeling hurt but knows she must forgive, how does that heal the marriage? Isn't it just like being a doormat? I know Jesus told Peter we must forgive 70 times 7. How do I do that in my marriage? Well, the first thing you do, you say, you know, I married him, and so I'm responsible for doing it. But I, I, the biggest thing is to avoid controversy and just kind of stay away from it. I mean, really, I mean, there's always some reason you trigger an, an argument and something. And um, if somebody is, is insulting and demeaning, just walk out of the room and shut the door. But if you harbor these things and you start to fight back, and then you've got controversy continuously. That, that's all I can tell you, but, you know, as I say, dear, you married him. I didn't, okay? This is Patricia who says, Hi, Pat, will you please explain what the Great Tribulation is? Well, the Bible talks about a time. Jesus said it very clearly. Uh, when, when, if, if this time had been, not been shortened, there'd be no flesh living on earth. So I, I really, I wrote a book called The End of the Age, and I had a, an asteroid hitting the earth. And I do believe that something like this will happen. You know, the sun won't give its light, the moon won't shine, and the stars will fall from heaven. But that's what Jesus said, the time will come. But um, we shouldn't be spending our time looking for the, pre, the, the, the uh, tribulation. And then you've got people who say, well, it's pre-tribulation and post-tribulation and uh, our trib and all this stuff. Um, I, I don't think that that's, you, you're not going to get raptured before. That's false theology. So there will be a time of testing. We, but uh, Christians have been engaging in tribulation ever since the early church. They've been persecuted ever since. But there will be a time, uh, and I, as I say, I, I thought it would be a, an asteroid, N not a great big one, but big enough to, uh, you know, uh, to wipe out maybe a, a third of the, of the population. And, and Jesus said, except those days were short, no flesh would be alive. But for the sake of the elect, they will be shortened. All right. Okay, this is Susan, Pat, who says, my friends who are Christians say they're still sinners just because they sin. I say I'm not a sinner because I'm a new creation in Christ. Who's right? Well, the Bible says if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. So uh, you have sinned, and all of sin is falling short of the glory of God. So the answer is, yes, we are sinners, but we are forgiven of our sins and we're cleansed from sin. <clears throat> but there's such a thing as 
sanctification where we come into the state where God is, we're walking with Him, and most people haven't reached that stage yet. Then there's glorification when we finally are dead and our spirits go to be with the Lord. This is Jim who says, Jesus said that if we have faith, we could do what he did and more. Except for the apostles, has there been anyone able to do that, to have that kind of faith? Well, you, you say, well, wh what is he doing? You know, Jesus walked around in, in, in Israel, and maybe even though he had big crowds, maybe at max he, he got to talk to 30, 40,000 or 500, maybe. Um, how many people would do? 100,000, something. We talk to millions on television. So in a sense, we're doing greater things than he did, not, not necessarily greater miracles. He did miracles that we all just stand in awe of. But in terms of, of extension, we are to do, and that's what he said, we, I, the works that I do, you shall do, and greater works than these because I'm going to my Father. So I think we should expect to see the miracles of the Lord being worked out in some of us, but we also should see an extension of what he's doing. And, and we, we here at CBN, I mean, right now I'm talking to more people probably than he did in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Oh, for certain. Really? Yes. I mean, that, that, that's greater. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunity. <laughs> when the pandemic hit, the Zeons were quick to put on uh, the, the masks not just because they were afraid of virus, this whole family put on masks. Why? To hide their daughter's face. Jai Rui couldn't wait to meet her baby sister. I want to share my candy with her and jump rope together. But the day Shin Rui was born, her sister's hopes quickly faded. The doctor held that the baby in front of me and said there was something wrong with her. Her mouth was broken and it scared me. I didn't know what would happen to her. Shin Rui had a cleft lip and palate. The doctor said if we couldn't accept it, it might be better to give up the child. But when her little hand grabbed mine, I felt something in my heart that I can't describe. And I was committed to sticking it out until the end. Within a few months, Shin Rui was back in the hospital with trachea and lung problems caused by her cleft lip. When she breathed in cold air through her nose, she would catch a cold, and then she would cough and have a fever. Then she'd choke and cry. Her face turned red, and it seemed she might choke to death. With all the medical costs, sometimes the family could barely buy rice and noodles. So there was no way they could afford surgery. And as Shin Rui got older, she started noticing her lip. She looked in the mirror and asked me why her lips were different from other people's. I was worried she would have a sense of inferiority and maybe she would develop autism. People stayed far away from us, thinking it might be some kind of contagious disease. So even before the coronavirus pandemic began in China, the Zhangs had Shin Rui wear a mask to hide her lip. Jai Rui wore one too. She made her sister feel like wearing a mask was very important. Meanwhile, the couple desperately searched for assistance. I knew the sooner she had the surgery, the better the result would be. Then they heard about a cleft lip clinic where CBN was helping poor children in need. And we made sure Shin Rui got her cleft lip surgery free of charge. Her immune system has improved a lot, and she's very cheerful. On behalf of my family, thank you. It would have taken us more than 10 years to save for the surgery. Now we feel like we have a big warm family all over the world. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for mending my sister's mouth. Just think of that. Isn't that marvelous? That child would have been marked for the rest of her life. Not only sick along the way, but shunned. And many cultures, they'd think it was some demonic thing that she had something that, you know, would be contagious. They couldn't get near her. But we were able, because of your help, to help little Jian 
And what a marvelous thing to see a new life. You know, we're thrilled at that. So if you want to participate, that's just one of the things we do. There's so many things that CBN does, but part of it is Operation Blessing. And we give medical help, we give food, we give clothing, uh, and we, we uh, of course, take the gospel around the world. But Operation Blessing helps as many as 300 million people around the world every year. It's big. And how do you do it? Well, it's just $20 a month, the 700 Club. That's all it takes. And you can be a part of helping people like that sweet little boy. Now, I was this little girl. I forget your little girl. Oh, well, you know, I, it's a little boy, I think. Yeah, boy. It's, at well, first I thought it was yeah, a girl, too. Little, okay, little okay. well, anyway, a little Jean. In any event, I want to give you this. People seem to like this. It's, it's verses of salvation, peace, and victory taken from the book of Romans. And um, I read these books are, and people. Well, I have a, somebody here, Zenaida, who lives in Baltimore, Maryland, said, Dear Pat Robertson, thank you for your special CD, God is for us. It's really the right moment. Now we really need faith and peace. It's a powerful message to millions to experience love and peace and that God is for us. You know, Pat, I think it also, as you read Romans, sort of solidifies again. Yeah what we believe, why we believe it, God's plan and purpose, it's really wonderful. It really is, and these verses will bless your heart, and we'll give this to you as our gift when you join the 700 Club, when we receive your first payment on the pledge of $20 a month. We'll send you this CD, God is for us, okay? Imagine waking up every morning with your lips stuck to your gums or being afraid of choking every time you follow, swallow food. That's how Angel Camden lived for 10 years. Doctors couldn't help her. So how did she get healed in a carpool line? Take a look. My mouth was just extremely dry and I suffered with it for more than a decade. I would wake up in the morning and my lips would literally be stuck to my gums and I would have to go and just rinse and rinse and rinse with water. I kept water on my nightstand. I took a bottle of water with me everywhere I went. I did speak with my physician who suggested that I speak with my dentist and my dentist gave me a few options through the years and I did try things but nothing was really successful. And. I just thought that it was something I was going to have to live with. It was stressful when I was eating. I was very concerned that I was going to choke. I would chew very slowly, very small bites, almost like a toddler, and would wash down every bite with a drink of water. I was in the carpool line at my son's school, and I was scrolling through Facebook on my phone, and whenever I see a post from the 700 Club, I always stop and pray along with them. And on this day, Terry was praying. You have yes. like a, an unbelievably dry mouth mm -hmm. all the time. It affects the way you're able to eat, the taste of your food. God's healing that for you right now. Your saliva is just going to begin to produce again, and you're going to be back to where you were before. I just started going, oh my Lord, that's me, that's me. And I prayed along with her, and by the next day, I woke up completely normal. I jumped up and went straight to my knees and said, thank you, Lord, praise you, Jesus. I was actually saying to him, Lord, I never even thought to pray about this. I just thought it was something, a minor inconvenience that was major to me that I was just going to have to live with and suffer through, and it never even occurred to me to give this to you and thank you. I just kept saying thank you, thank you, praise you, Lord. I now understand that he cares about every teeny tiny detail of our lives, not just the big things, not just the major things. He loves us, he wants us to be happy, he wants us to be healthy, he wants us to feel good all the time and everything that bothers us matters to him. You know, he's our dad. Your dad cares about you. He knows your name. He knows your need. He has the power to make a difference. And his arms are extended to you. So 
We want to take some time to pray you for people. You have today. another testimony well, there. I do. Praying. This right. is Carlos. 14 years ago, Carlos of Hagerstown, Indiana, had to have knee surgery. Since then, he still suffered terrible pain. He was watching the 700 Club on April of this year when he heard you, Pat, say, there's a knee injury. You've fallen. Your kneecap has just been crushed. It's really a bad thing. God is knitting that together. It's the left knee, and you're being completely healed right now. Just put your hand on it in the name of Jesus, and that thing's coming together. It'll be a miracle. Well, it happened to be a right knee for Carlos, but he touched and agreed for his healing. He has been pain-free ever since. Praise God. Amen. Now, we're going to join hands, folks. We want to pray for you. God's no respecter of persons, and He loves you. Father, we praise you. We thank you for these miraculous things that you're doing. Day by day by day, we hear and learn of what it is. And now, Lord, we come before you and we praise you and we ask for a touch of God for people in this audience because we know it is your plan that we would prosper and be in health, even our soul prospers. Now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. There's a gastrointestinal problem. I believe they, the name Elmer comes to me. And if you just touch your stomach right now, there'll be, you'll feel like a fire going through you and you're healed in Jesus' name. Terry? Yes, yeah, someone else, you have issues with your lungs. You've actually had COVID and no, no treatment seems to touch this. That, then nobody knows whether you'll have it for a long time or not. You're being healed right now. Just reach up your hands, breathe deeply, and begin to praise God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Yes, someone and we, else with, with ribs, you've been in some kind of a, a fall or an accident and you've broken some ribs, so painful. God's healing that for you right now and that pain's just going to slowly diminish in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a dislocated uh, disc in your, in your spine, it's dislocated mm. right now. Uh, I believe the name's Herman. You're being healed in Jesus' name. Touch him. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm wherever you are. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. If you want further prayer, telephone numbers available. Counsel's at the phone. They'd love to hear from you. Today's Power Minute is from Isaiah 53. By His stripes, we are healed. Tomorrow, making water out of thin air, the groundbreaking technology that's creating streams in the desert. For Terry and all of us, thank you for so much for being with us. This is Pat Robertson. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.